Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Polygenic Risk Scores, Challenges for Individualized Prediction of Disease Risk. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Andrew Peterson, CEO of Broadwing Bio and Principal at Sargum Consulting. Dr. Peterson has over 30 years of research experience and a passion for helping individuals, organizations, and societies use genetics to plan for good health. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following his presentation. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peterson. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hello, we're gonna talk about uh, polygenic risk scores and specifically the challenges that they face in terms of implementation, both at the technological level, the technical level, as well as, uh, as uh, alluding to the issues that face uh, the implementation of polygenic risk scores in terms of the, you know, the regulatory and the business model considerations, but really focusing on the technical issues. So the challenges for the application of polygenic risk scores uh, is that at present, the, because they are based on uh, existing data sets of disease, they are really only applicable to individuals of European origin. And that's because most of genetic studies that have been carried out today, uh, genome-wide association studies, the, the, the foundation for, uh, for polygenic risk scores, Almost in almost all of the large scale GWAS studies have been carried out in populations of European origin. So the solution for that, of course, is ultimately to carry out large GWAS studies in other population groups. Um, and then in terms of the utility for the patient and for the healthcare delivery system, really that's an unexplored area at this point. Three value cases have been highlighted, but over 1500 trait uh, polygenic risk scores have been generated. Um, and so really what the, the present situation is that we are faced with challenges that we can see glimmers of how they can be solved or we can see clear roads to being solved, but we're still in that, in that uh, window of time where the, the, um, the, uh, we can see the, the potential uh, applications of polygenic risk scores. We know the problems we need to address and solve. And so there's a window of opportunity to get everything right. Um, and then just in terms of the regulatory and the business model, there is not a valid uh, um, a validation that's been done for the, for the payer and the regulatory approval. Um, and that's gonna require investment uh, by someone uh, with, a, with a business model. So there's need for innovation there as well in terms of exactly how um, polygenic risk scores will be implemented into, into the US healthcare system. But focusing on the, the technical issues um, and taking a step back, the goals of human genetics uh, are, from my formulation, to predict disease risk, and that's of, of benefit for population risk prediction, for health resource planning and allocation, for individual risk pre uh, prediction, so enabling treatment, patient management, treatment, and lifestyle decisions, and then finally, therapeutic intervention, so identifying reversible processes that are driving disease progression. So we're going to focus on, you know, that top part and, and most, uh, for the most part, on individual risk prediction, because I think that's where, uh, uh, the, that's the, 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 um, the appropriate place to think about polygenic risk scores and how they, uh, uh, what the challenges are and what are the benefits. So uh, the genetic, uh, really the, the, uh, the um, thinking, the development of polygenic risk scores is based on some, some kind of basic characteristics of the genetic architecture of disease. So early on in genetics, uh, in human genetics, I should say, uh, there was a focus on a few loci of large effects. That was what we knew how to identify, how to study. 
So uh, Mendelian uh, diseases, recessive disease, dominant disease of large effect where really eggs could be mapped to single loci. On the flip side, starting uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, it's really starting with the, um, the uh, Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, uh, it was identified that it was possible to effectively measure and identify many loci of small effect, so polygenic. So this is what I'm referring to as the genetic architecture of disease, the, these two extremes in terms of genetic effects, and polygenic risk scores are really built on that, those many loci of small effects. So how do, we, how do we measure those and use those many loci of small effect to provide a risk prediction for an individual. So uh, at, in the earliest days of uh, the genome-wide association studies, people began to see if they could add together the, the um, significant loci that were identified for any particular disease. So this is not in the very early days, this example that I'm giving here, but it illustrates the same, the same, basic, uh, the same basic point. So this is from a paper in Circulation. Um, where uh, a polygenic risk score based on 57 SNPs, so 57 loci, uh, was, was created. So again, looking at the, uh, the um, allele, allelic status at each one of these loci for an individual allows one to add together the effects, and the effects do appear to be additive, add together the effects and produce an aggregate risk prediction, the aggregate contribution of each of these 57 uh, loci. So there's a couple of points. One is early efforts focused on, uh, on loci that were, uh, had met on their own genome-wide significance, so an arbitrary uh, p-value threshold. Um, and that pr uh, put a limitation on the number of loci just because the sample size of the case control studies was, uh, uh, was early on relatively small. So the earliest uh, efforts at polygenic risk scores were based on five, 10, et cetera, um, loci that had met genome-wide significance. Um, and it did provide risk prediction, but not at a level that was useful for predicting risk for an individual, for making an individual decision um, as to, uh, as to um, treatment uh, or intervention. So that brings us to the second point, which is shown in the, illustrated, I should say, in the bottom right, and that is that individuals, if we really focus on the red bar graphs, individuals at high genetic risk because of they carried the risk loci for, for many of these 57 SNPs, they respond well to statins in terms of the reduction in cardiovascular risk. Um, so that's illustrated by the fact that the, uh, the hazard ratio there, about 0.56 uh, of the individuals on statin versus those on placebo. So that's, again, an important point. These 57 uh, SNPs, when used together to, to create a polygenic risk score, led to information that was meaningful for treatment intervention. So the, uh, another advance which has happened most recently and I, uh, is that it was recognized that the limitation of only using variants, uh, loci that had met genome-wide significance was somewhat arbitrary because doing a larger study would bring more loci into that, that, uh, that um, significant range. And so approaches were developed for using yeah, many, many variants. So in this case, this is a, what's called a genome-wide polygenic risk score, which uses over 6 million variants um, to construct a, uh, a, um, a polygenic risk score. So as you add in more variants of smaller effect, of course, each individual one has less and less uh, impact on the overall score. But again, you're sampling from a much larger set. And again, you can see that, um, that there is a, um, a, a, a clear segregation in risk as shown there in terms of the polygenic risk score percentile, percentile the case control. Um, but the other thing is because one has so many variants, um, one can um, really start subdividing the, the um, um, risk into smaller and smaller uh, uh, percentiles or bins of risk. 
Um, so obviously with 6 million um, variants, one is not limited in the number of, uh, of uh, um, uh, categories that one can place individuals in terms of risk. And what that showed us that was that by using more and more um, risk variants and being able to look at, uh, in this case, the top one percentile is illustrated here, that one could develop polygenic risk scores for a certain complex disease that had predictive power, uh, predictive, um, uh, predictive power equivalent to single loss of functional allele. So the, the comparison here would be for coronary artery disease, this five-fold increased risk of the top one percentile of risk compared to the, all the other individuals, so that uh, nearly five to one, is similar to what the increased risk that, it's, that occurs with variants that cause familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so similarly for a number of other uh, uh, disease conditions, uh, you can see that the top, uh, the individuals at the highest risk uh, have risk which is many uh, multiples of what the general population risk is. So what is the implications of that? So again, using the, uh, it's sticking with the example of cardiovascular risk, which is I think where we, uh, we have the clearest picture of the potential utility of polygenic risk scores. There's a, uh, a standard approach, the pooled, co pooled cohort equation approach, where one uh, uses a number of different clinical factors. And this illustrated here is cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, also included our diabetes status, et cetera. Gives you a relative risk prediction. So polygenic risk can also give you a relative risk prediction. And importantly, uh, what has been recognized is that the risk of the pooled cohort equation uh, um, factors is independent of that of the polygenic risk. So in other words, polygenic risk gives you another powerful indicator of cardiovascular risk. So then that allows then a combined risk to be, uh, to be potentially calculated where the clinical risk and the polygenic risk uh, 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 are combined together to give different risk categories. Um, so, that gives us an idea of how polygenic risk factors can be applied in the, in the clinic. As I said, cardiovascular risk is something where we are used to thinking about um, uh, uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention. So managing the clinical situation, the clinical factors with, uh, with medication and lifestyle changes to avoid um, an outcome, in that case, a cardiovascular event. In many other disease situations, the ability to predict risk has not been robust and therefore the, the paradigms, the clinical management approaches for managing risk have not been uh, developed to that degree. But you can really see from that how the, the, what the potential possibilities are. So uh, I moved on to the next slide uh, a little bit prematurely, but the point is that uh, is to illustrate um, um, one of the, the greatest barriers to application of polygenic risk uh, clinically right now. And that is that the data sets that we have for constructing these risk scores are based on European populations. It's very graphically il illustrated here. You can see the big fat red segment of the curve going across uh, in the middle there. Um, that's the number of individuals who have been included in genome-wide association studies. There's colored bars, there's a rainbow there at the bottom of other populations. I'm going to be telling you about the purple line there, um, where there's very, very few individuals have been included in, uh, in genome-wide association studies, that is South Asians. And then on the right-hand side is uh, a reminder of the relative proportion of the, of the global population of the different groups there. Um, and you can see that um, South Asians make up a very significant fraction of the global population. So there's a very significant um, uh, opportunity to, um, to introduce polygenic risk prediction into patient management for South Asians. So I'm gonna skip past that really quickly. So the question then is we can recognize this disparity. How do we solve it? I'm going to be telling you a little bit about studies that I've been involved in uh, that have sought to address that, that, um, that deficit. It's based on a, on a consortium, the Genome Asia 100,000, 100K. So uh, uh, the first phase of this was published last December in Nature. I'm not going to spend any time talking about that, but tell you about the, the overall approach. 
So that what was published there last December, I'm gonna call phase one. And that was the, uh, the uh, first part of the efforts to address this disparity where we used um, um, whole genome sequencing of genomes from uh, all across Asia. Asia is a very large and diverse part of the world, of course. That helped us develop strategies for more regionally focused efforts. And uh, what I'll tell you a little bit about is phase two, where, uh, or one of the phase two activities focused on India. So again, using whole genome sequencing to build uh, a description of the population structure and then tools uh, that will allow uh, genetic studies to be carried out more effectively and economically. So optimized reference panel and optimized SNP array. And then ultimately what that does is make it possible to, care, to generate large data sets, case control and other data sets for disease in, that occurs in South Asians. It allows us to have a much better prediction uh, uh, of genetic risk in uh, South Asian populations. So South Asia has very distinct origins from European populations. That's shown on the left-hand side. I won't uh, spend any time talking about that. That's referring to population history from um, tens of thousands of years ago. So that's the top bullet points across the top that South Asian origins are very different from Europeans or East Asians, hence the failure of European um, genetic data to adequately predict risk in South Asians. There's many, many thousands of population groups. Uh, there are also strong founder effects which occur. Um, and what that uh, 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 implies in terms of genetics is that functional variants, missense and loss of, loss of function variants occur at higher frequency. And then finally, there are much higher rates of endogamy and consanguinity. So in other words, the chances are that um, that a, um, uh, one's parents um, are more closely related than is common in Europe is, is, uh, occurs at a higher rate in, in South Asia. So importantly, what we did was we focused on data that came from individuals who were in the healthcare delivery system. So in other words, individuals who would be sampled in medical genetic studies. And also importantly, given the diversity the, uh, of humanity across South Asia. We focused on the three corners of the subcontinent um, as capturing the genetic diversity across the subcontinent. So that's shown there in the, uh, the inset map on the left-hand side, where we sampled from uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh, from South India and from Pakistan. So we used high coverage whole genome sequencing to sample that diversity. You can see in this UMAP plot that, uh, that's in the middle part, that, which, uh, which uh, captures the effects of genetic diversity by uh, clustering together individuals whose genetic variation uh, is limited between them, so people who are genetically similar, and spreads apart individuals who are um, more dissimilar. So you can see that there are three, uh, that the three geographic regions, the individuals cluster together, um, and that they cluster separately. And, and you can see, of course, a rough map of the subcontinent um, that is formed. We can recreate the corners of the geography in the genetic diversity. And then importantly, there is a lot of substructure. So uh, in other words, clustering together and clustering apart within each of those regions. And we can get a picture of what the, the uh, basis is for that by using some of the data from our first phase of our project where you can see that uh, there's colored dots uh, overlaying the gray dots of the general population. And you can see that the colored dots, which are individuals from identified groups, um, illustrate what some of those patterns are in the overall general population. Um, from that data, what we did was we generated a reference panel. So a reference panel is, uh, allows one to impute missing genotypes. So a foundation of the, geno of the GWAS era was that relatively sparse genotyping arrays could be used to capture um, uh, a much larger fraction of the total variation essentially by interpolating between genotypes. And a reference panel uh, allows one to interpolate effectively. And so uh, uh, what has been a standard is the thousand genomes reference panel that's shown here with the uh, red or orange dots. Um, and then the blue dots are shown the, uh, the um, 
the, uh, the output from using the reference panel that we created from those um, South, the large number of South Asian individuals. And what's shown on the x-axis is the allele frequency. On the y-axis is the um, is the um, R square, uh, the accuracy, the R squared, uh, for each genotype, um, where we uh, we interpolate and then we look at the um, the um, the accuracy of those interpolate interpolations, those uh, imputations. And you can see that thousand genomes never gets up above uh, about 0.8 no matter how common uh, the, uh, the allele is. So you know, even at a, a 50, uh, 0.5, minor allele frequency of 0.5, so it's a 50-50 guess, um, still it doesn't uh, do um, tremendously well. Whereas there's a significant improvement with the Genome Asia phase two panel. So what that then implies is that um, much, more, uh, much more accurate genotyping can be done using SNP arrays with the use of this reference panel. And then what we also did with that data set uh, of individuals from across South Asia is we generated a new genotyping array. So again, it's relatively sparse compared to the overall number of amount of variation in the genome, but by combining this new genotyping array together with the reference panel, there's, we can create very dramatic improvements in the ability to genotype uh, South Asians at, a, at a, uh, a cost which is much lower than using um, high coverage whole genome sequencing. So what's illustrated here is the number of variants that are directly genotyped, uh, the number of variants that affect protein coding capacity on the new array on the left-hand side uh, versus a standard array, the uh, Illumina GSA array. And you can see that we are genotyping many more functional variants in the, gene, in the genome with this new array. So that combined with the improved imputation of the reference panel um, produces a much uh, dramatic improvements and ability to, um, to carry out large scale data sets, which will then allow much improved um, uh, polygenic risk scores. So the, the phase three I had on, um, on the overall strategy, uh, and this is what is meant by phase three, which is really combining these tools together with high quality um, patient uh, population data, data sets, uh, sample and, and uh, database, clinical database sets to create um, a very large uh, clinical genomic databases that will allow effective and accurate, uh, will allow economically the creation of uh, very um, um, uh, large scale data sets. So uh, I will stop there. Um, there's many individuals who have contributed to all of the work, everything I've said. I tried to have citations on the slide for the, for the literature citations, but I have many collaborators um, that have contributed to the work I summarized at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move on into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So our first question is, for PRS to be applicable for non-Caucasian populations, what screening strategy would you recommend? Andrew, I'm having trouble hearing you. It, 
possibly you could have to change your, since you have the AirPods in, you could have to change the mic or the audio to the AirPods um, down here in the right corner of your presentation. There's a, I think there's a change audio source. If the audience could just hold on with us for a few minutes while we get this sorted out, it should, shouldn't take us too long. We love these technical difficulties of the new normal. I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. Well, we heard you just fine before this started. So this is, uh, it's, it's always something new, it seems like. Um, so if you click, there's a little, um, there's a little volume button on the bottom right of your screen, of your picture, you can see yourself. Go up to the little gear, select audio output device. And instead of default, you'll check, you can check headphones, which that should maybe go to your eye. AirPods, or you can take it off of that and just do default. I think the air. I think if you click AirPods, you took them out. Do you? See, did you go to the select audio? Just hang tight with us audience. It should be just a few more minutes and we'll, we'll get it figured out. So if you go to that select audio output device, there's a default, a default headphones and a default, and then just a headphones. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not the most technologically savvy, but I think, okay, we're saying log out and then log back in and we'll see if we can't get the audio to work. So audience, if you just hold tight with us for a few minutes, Thank you so much for your understanding. So, so we'll just give it a few minutes here to see if Andrew can log back in. Dr. Peterson, and if not, we can respond to the questions via email. And if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. And if we can't get them to get to them today, Dr. Peterson can respond via email via the contact that you have uh, provided. Okay, looks like so can Dr. You Peterson me? may be with us. Can you, hi Jennifer, can you hear me? Hi, now? I hi. can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. 
Okay, I can see myself in the window. Let's see. If I... Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, I, let me ask you this question again, and then, oh, well, it disappeared. Um, uh, yeah, well, let's move Do let's you remember what it was? Question. Do you remember the question? Uh, yes, I do. It, it was what was the what was the critical limitation in applying polygenic risk scores and to non-Caucasian populations, non-European populations, and really the critical limitation is having carried out genome-wide association studies um, uh, on those populations. So, in the case, so so in other words, to predict cardiovascular risk, uh, the critical limitation is having carried out cardiovascular risk studies in in the population, South Asian population, for example. So. Okay. And let's see, I'm going to go with one more question and then uh, we will, we will wrap it up. Would you use a whole genome array or exome sequency to look at pharmacogenomics and other markers associated with drug recovery targets, drug discovery targets? Well, yeah. So for drug discovery, exome sequencing is particularly valuable. So, you know, I've been emphasizing in this presentation polygenic risk scores where really there's, uh, you know, there's for and for, for pharmacogenomics. So for polygenic risk and pharmacogenomics, I, I think an array is probably the preferable platform for a number of reasons, um, you know, uh, robust, um, reproducible, um, validatable, um, which is important. Um, for drug discovery studies, which is really a, a, a research question, then um, exome sequencing can, can be very um, powerful because it can identify not uh, identify variants that have not previously been described. So, you know, an array is really uh, limited to identifying or recognizing variants that have already been described somewhere somewhere before. And actually, we have a, we have time for a few more questions, so we can we can just roll right on through. Is there a specific number of SNPs to construct a PRS? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and the the short answer is no. Um, the more SNPs that are used to construct the the uh, PRS, the the um, you know the the more discriminatory power you will have, and the more um, predictive power. So both of those things. So the more predictive power, because each individual SNP is only giving you a little bit of prediction. So the more you can add together, the better. But there's no threshold um, that you can uh, say ahead of time in terms of number of SNPs. You'd want to set your threshold based on what kind of prediction you want to be able to make. So in clinical care, you know, you can set that kind of a threshold um, by, say, for example, you know, how many people do you want to screen to identify those people who would benefit from some intervention? So interventions typically have um, some um, consequences. So for instance, if there's a, you, if you have a risk of uh, prostate cancer, and so you're going to do a, a test and then perhaps a surgical biopsy. So that surgical biopsy has some risk. So you want to set your number such that you're not testing people who have very low risk. So you want enough predictive power to do that. And that's really what sets the SNPs. It's not anything intrinsically about the SNPs. It's about what the, what the, um, what the degree of predictive power you want. And that is really the area that I alluded to in terms of regulatory and the business model, because there's a trade-off then between predictive ability and what you do with the prediction. Um, so you have to kind of go work through that in each case. Okay, thank you. And last question, would you recommend the Sargam Array for studies on South Asians in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, the Middle East, and other countries with a minor South Asian population? Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, it's designed to be uh, relevant and valid uh, for uh, genotyping for any South Asians. Um, so it doesn't matter where they're, you know, resident because, uh, you know, we, we covered all the, uh, uh, the genetic diversity in South Asia as a whole. I mean, there the trade-off is, of course, you know, the, do you use a different array for each population group in somewhere like uh, um, Singapore where there's Malaysians, Chinese, and South Indians? Um, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a trade-off question that's kind of a pragmatic question. Do you use multiple arrays or do you use one array, which is... Um, you know, works for everybody, but not perfectly for everybody. So, 
Well, thank you again, Dr. Peterson, for your outstanding presentation. Um, this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing and for the next 12 months. Please share it with a colleague who might be interested in today's topic. Also, don't miss out on our other valuable presentations on our agenda. You can visit the Agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Uh, thank you again, audience, for your participation. Until next time, goodbye.